for lunch. Um, we are very, very delighted to now introduce our next guest, Michael Schindhelm. Um, David Deutsch at the South Moment in Fabric of Reality, he's a great quantum physicist, uh, David Deutsch from Oxford. He once said, you know, the 21st century is all about parallel realities. And uh, the biography of Michael Schindhelm in this sense is a very, very 21st century biography, having grown up in East Germany, having actually studied quantum chemistry in the Soviet Union. He lives today as a writer and also as a filmmaker in Lugano and London. Uh, in previous uh, uh, activities, one can say, when we met a couple of years ago, he was also a theater director and impresario. In another meeting, I met uh, Michel as a cultural politician, one could almost say cultural mayor um, of Dubai, and the list is long. Today we uh, have Michel with us as a filmmaker, as a director of uh, movies, and we have a very special kind of world premiere, or it's actually a pre-premiere, because the film will be launched in a few days. It's a film which has a very strong connection to Switzerland, of course, because it's the Chinese lives of Uli Sik, um, the many lives of, uh, of Uli Sik. Uh, the film, as I said, will be launched very soon, uh, but will be pre-launched here today, so what you're going to see now, no one has ever seen it before, uh, and Michael will then be with us for a Q&A. A very, very warm welcome to Michael Chinham and to his film on Uli Sik. He's the most respectful Chinese artist, collector, and mentor uh, to the uh, contemporary Chinese artists. Er ist nicht nur ein Sammler von Objekten, sondern er ermöglicht ihm oftmals die Existenz von Werken.
Wir sind von unserem chinesischen Partner empfangen worden. Das ist das Ministry of Construction Machinery gewesen. Und die Bauern ist hier immer gleichzeitig. So sind wir dann in die ersten Verhandlungen gestiegen. Wir sind immer 25 Personen sicher gegenüber gesessen. Es ist immer sehr viel geraucht worden, Zigaretten, Paft. Ich konnte manchmal die gegenüberliegende Wand gar nicht wahrnehmen. Es war so dicke Schlucht. Sieg brachte Technologie, die man in China zu jeder Zeit wirklich dringend brauchte. Und deswegen war sein Verhältnis mit den Chinesen ausgezeichnet. Und zwar auf allen Ebenen. In der Fabrik. Er konnte mit Leuten sprechen in der Fabrik. Viele können das nicht. Der oberen Etage, Uri, konnte das. Und hat also den Zugang zum Herzen sofort gefunden. <lacht> Und auf dem Weg dort auch noch ein Plakat von vollzogenen Einrichtungen. Ja, ich muss ihn behalten, ich habe den Titel. Titel. Ja, ich muss ihn behalten. Ich muss ihn behalten. Ich muss ihn behalten. Ich muss ihn behalten.但是你在你現在留在寝室裡面留在學校裡面很講條件然後就動手講勤奮勤奮不好呢就分別別去西藏啊很遠的地方去其實不好就是這些學生分別很遠很遠去Life was quite tough and uh, it's a come to the really bottom way of surviving. That's uh, my early use, so I don't much education. I only study your channel more slogans and uh, 窗花是中国北方的一个特别有趣的一件事情拿那种红色的手工纸绞成叠起来绞完之后打开是一个非常漂亮的一个窗花然后把它贴到窗子上我尝了时间我晚上看到我母亲的脚的窗花我看了看了
，就是天上塌下来了，然后明天那个美帝苏修就要来打中国来了，所以小张就在想，我们得找，我们得找枪，然后那个得准备跟他们战斗这样。这个年轻人的这种。好奇啊，好动啊，这种异常的这种兴奋。那么，在这个清场的这个过程里面呢，呃，因为因为这些学生是主要目标嘛。Studenten, die haben das Herz auf dem rechten Fleck, aber im Resultat haben sie nach der Volksrepublik in der Entwicklung vielleicht in zehn Jahren zurückgeworfen. So China decided to, or the Communists decided to really limit the Western inference. The time there's no gallery, no museum, no no any art newspaper or or even article talk about art. I'm 九十年初到北到北京的，所以我到北京来就开始画了这个面具的这个这种类型的作品，隐藏真实的一个自己。我到了一个新的一个特别陌生的环境里面。我觉得我就是这样一个状态。那我可能同时在画很多作品的时候，我就其中有一张面具的作品，就是说，我觉得这是这个作品特别像我自己，所以我就画了大概十年的时间，画了一系列这样的类型的作品。When I was thirteen, the summer I have some chance to be in some advertising, TV advertising. From a, remember, it's like some soft dream. Another is uh, medicine is for the for the young, you know, for the obsolete. And have to smile, dancing. I think it's my first time with camera action. Well, the first time when I saw the Japanese video game, you know, the classic games, I think, wow, well, yeah, I will make a video and I'll make the launch. Paintings, brutal paintings called Game Over Long Watch. Since then, I said I'm going to design my own video game software about Long Watch. China with art studio do a lot of uh, uh, research, and this is very different in other collectors. Some collector just come to visit and I bought this, I bought that, or they hear some name who is popular or looking for the marketing, looking for auction. <laughs> so I think Wooly have his uh, volume or his uh, his own idea. Wir sind nach einer langen Freundschaft begleitet. Wir haben dann auch gemeinsam ein großes Projekt gemacht. R&D City. Ich bin dort auch der erste Bürgermeister von der virtuellen Stadt gsi. Every day we would read all those newspapers in the morning. So once I made a work called a newspaper reader. A reader. Because I found out in his home there was no bookshelf at that time. Now he he pretend he has some bookshelves, but in the bookshelf is only art catalogs, which he wouldn't call his books. I can explain that from my perspective, would be all the wichtig on this world to all the rest of the Zeitung stand. Er hat mir einfach eines Tages gesagt, gib mir eine Kleidung von dir. Und er hat eine Kleidung, für was soll ich eine Kleidung? Ja, gib mir einfach eine Schale von dir, das ist sie. Und das sind auch grosse internationale Sammler, die dann ganz viel nach vorne auf Ende geblieben sind, sind auf den Plan treten. Thank you. 
有任何代言。现在不能起来，现在觉得人们很很健康的活着，很开心的活着，这个很是最重要的。Bereits heute gehen über 40 Millionen Festlandchinesen pro Jahr nach Hongkong. Und von denen werden viele der Welt das Museum finden und das erste Mal wirklich in der Tiefe auch mit ihrer eigenen Kunstbekanntschaft machen. I would say the art and the literature in that society 
if it's not in questioning, not authority, it's a fake. synopsis for the Chinese lives of Ulysse kind of time and space become conflated in its final lines. A pig is slaughtered, an art fell, is obstructed, an Olympic stadium is built, a Chinese president is greeted, a bridge is crossed. I was kind of wondering if you could talk a little bit about, because Rachel Rose talked about, you know, kind of multiple time frames, about you know, also about fragments in terms of, uh, of our films. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this and maybe also how you pieced all of these fragments together. Mm. And, uh, I know Lysik already for in the meantime probably almost 15 years uh, when I prepared another film on the making of the Olympic Games Stadium in Beijing. Uh, that was 2000-2001 uh, at the time. And I found this kind of really interesting and uh, for, for various reasons. Uh, one reason was that uh, at the same time, uh, when he um, entered for the first time China in 79, I actually uh, entered the Soviet Union, uh, starting to study there. And of course, he was 50 years or so older than me, but sort of I could really imagine sort of the reenacting the emotions he had when he was a Swiss guy at the time, entered uh, China. And we were befriending and uh, spending more uh, time more often in, in China during the next years. Um, and I really thought uh, when he decided to donate his collection to Hong Kong in 2012, uh, now his mission is sort of complete. And uh, it's probably a good idea to now try to capture his history, uh, his biography uh, in, a, in a film. And, uh, I really have from the beginning uh, a clear vision uh, how to reenact also this part of his life which is not visible anymore because you know that China is an extremely fast uh, changing society and country so cities have changed entirely their face, people look very different, etc. Even than 10 years ago, I mean, I'm just looking today at my film about the Olympic Games Day and compare it with this film, it's again another China, so that alone 35 years ago or so. So you have really uh, in China this constantly this experience of facing multiple times um, and uh, fragmentations also of connections and uh, of, uh, um, of stories. And I wanted indeed to handle this. Uh, I was a bit lucky because I found somebody who had uh, great footage about uh, the early 80s. I was almost uh, Enchanted because um, you know probably um, Antonioni's film about uh, China from '74 when Antonioni was invited to uh, to China by Xun Lai and shot his um, documentary uh, The Middle Kingdom, uh, which was the first time the Western world had seen images of the people of the Cultural Revolution. So this uh, this material I'm using here in the film for the first time was shot only six years later and it was almost the same. So it's really interesting to to using. Um, uh, on a visual level, all these different, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, the, these, these different, this, this, this footage of, of different times. And there's also something else uh, I was very happy with. Uh, I discovered music of the uh, late 70s and uh, early 80s. You have heard of uh, some fragments today already. Uh, so I was able to reenact also on that level um, uh, the, the early beginnings of Ulysses in China. Uh, by the way, it was really interesting to, to see how at that time, in the late 70s, early 80s, China rediscovered uh, its own musical heritage of the 50s and the 60s, but also during the Cultural Revolution. But suddenly you see that they were using also something like a Hammond organ or, or, organ or, or a uh, Hawaii guitar uh, for playing Mao songs. So this combination of uh, a sudden appearance of pop culture emerging in the country with this kind of communist past was, was uh, quite interesting to show also, to use also for the material here. 
That's interesting because uh, for me, you know, I experienced Pulisic's uh, embassy. You are in the film, of course. Yeah, but I was like, think about this when you are in, in, in exactly. the embassy. Exactly, experienced the story because it was really amazing in the mid-90s, so much later than, of course, it wasn't the beginnings. But in the mid-90s, we went to through Hanru to Beijing to make research for our show, Cities on the Move, the Chinese Art was much, much smaller. And it was really extraordinary to which extent the Swiss embassy played a pivotal role at that time because it was a kind of an Anlaufstelle. It was really mm -hmm. a place yeah, a relay, a harbinger, you know, a harbor in some kind of way for the Chinese art scene, which then was underground. Mm -hmm. Uli, of course, not only collected the artists, but also installed the work in the embassy. So, Wuhan and I lived a couple of days in the embassy, because we were living in a, in a living museum. And it was a great example of what, you know, an embassy can do. I always wonder, you know, why we don't have that today? We should have more Uli 6, we should, we should activate embassies. There are always bad embassies all over the world, you know. We should activate them. It's a great, great model. So it's wondering this amazing moment where the embassy becomes a laboratory. How how that plays out in the film, and how you could, could you reconstruct that, or how? Sure, because it was the beginning of uh, Uli's uh, systematic collection. He was not able seriously to even connect to artists before. So it all started out only around 1995, and uh, that was the time when really first artists uh, started to emerge and uh, to open their own practices and to be independent from academies, academies and schools, etc. Uh, so his position as a diplomat allowed him also to access these people in a different way. He would never have been able to do so in, in a similar way for, as, as a manager for Schindler or later as an entrepreneur. So in other words, um, it was also luck to some extent that all this happened. Right? There, there was a, you can really see that on the one hand there is a very talented man, uh, a Swiss man with uh, a great deal of uh, uh, lust for adventure, which is uh, something you wouldn't find so often uh, uh, elsewhere, but in Switzerland actually you do, I think so at least. So he's one of these guys who, uh, he actually had uh, uh, joined Schindler only a few months before he already moved to China. He had no clue whatsoever about this country when he moved there in 79. And at the same time, uh, the same way he actually entered the di diplomatic sphere, because he was of course an outsider after he was appointed by the uh, Bundesrat Koti in 1995 uh, to become the ambassador to China. And he used this uh, opportunity also for collecting his art. He became the first serious collector of contemporary Chinese art and the mentors of many, many of his artists. So you can see that there is a continuity in his life despite all the finance, uh, despite all the interruptions. And it's obviously a rare thing in, in Switzerland that some you know, sort of civil society who give a collection of art becomes ambassador. It's not a rare thing in Latin America. We heard earlier today about Cortazar, you know, Fuentes told me in my last encounter with him that, you know, uh, many, many, many ambassadors in Latin America were actually artists, were curators, were intellectuals. Mm -hmm. So kind of, I, I really think it's urgent that more embassies follow that sick model for the 21st century. We could reinvent all our embassies kind of all over. Now, to come back to to Uli, the conflation kind of, of time and space is not just related to the movement of the film, but it's also embedded within the protagonist himself. And, and you've said in, in the previous conversation we had that Sikh lives many lives, simultaneously and consecutively. So I was kind of wondering if you could tell us a little bit, because you spend so much time with him, about you know, these different kind of fragmented aspects of his identity and how they come together. On the one hand, Uli is a very straightforward person, I think. So it's always Uli, so that there are not different personalities you get him to, to see you, to meet. At least I have not, never met him in very different ways, uh, in very different uh, personalities. I would rather say he's a very coherent uh, person in many ways. He's, he's uh, somebody who uh, grew over time. He's extremely resilient. Uh, as you could see, he was a rower in the beginning. And I think this is probably the best metaphor to describe his character because he's still a rower. He still, as you can see, he's still rowing, indeed. But he is also uh, metaphorically rowing when he is uh, working in China as a manager in the 70s. At some point he said that I, of course, um, was exhausted and sometimes uh, desperate about the situation there. And I was relieved when I was able to go home one, once in a while. But at the same time, I knew when I'm finished, the others are finished too. Uh, and I think this is really this kind of strange uh, uh, motto for self-motivation he uses until today. So he's an entrepreneur and a very successful one, as we know. But at the same time, he is a very uh, sophisticated person, having learned a lot about China, and in the meantime, exploring also. He has a life after 
uh, his collection, uh, the, the Chinese collection today. He's already searching on, on uh, he's already on new missions. I don't even know exactly what it is about, but I've seen him traveling currently to some countries like uh, the Philippines or to Cuba, and I'm pretty sure that there's a reason why he's doing this. And there's probably something else to do uh, about him also in the, in the near future. Now, obviously, it's not you know, a coincidence that you made this film on Uli because mm -hmm. you know there is your own personal connection, of course. As I said in my introduction, your own practice in the few years we've known each other has to do with multiplicity and fragmentation. You uh, assume so many different roles. I don't know if that's connected to your actually quantum. Oh, yeah, three-minute paper is coming out, so we've got three minutes. Um, uh, so the three-minute camera. You know, I don't know if it's got to do with your own, and it's my last question, with your own background in quantum chemistry, mm -hmm. uh, to have all these parallel realities, but you want relation to what we heard earlier about, you know, fragments and traces, about the unfinishedness, no? Because you once said that your identity, your fragmented identity is unfinished. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on your own personal narrative in relation to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm coming from East Germany. This country even seems to exist uh, in the meantime 25 years ago. I have almost never lived in modern Germany since then, but I lived already before uh, some time uh, outside of the country. I never really felt uh, very German because I think this is something very German that uh, you have uh, a kind of artificial relationship to your own country because most of the be uh, beautiful things about this country uh, died in 1933. Uh, and all what happened afterwards uh, was a disaster. And afterwards, the, the kind of recovery was, uh, or the result of this recovery was something very different from the journey of before 1933. So, in other words, uh, from an already national angle, I would say it's hard to to uh, connect to, uh, to to Germany in this regard. But apart from this, um, when in the middle of your life, when I was 29, the war fell. Um, something extraordinary happens and you have to reinvent yourself, uh, then you uh, may experience also that um, there's not only one single thing you pursue, and you have uh, abilities and capacities and maybe necessities to do something completely different. And this is what I did, and also in different countries, I, I, I embraced it. I must say there was nothing more important than this. And I think uh, one uh, important thing to say here is that when the war fell, it was for, for me something uh, like um, a relief, and I felt um, free, really free. And I think freedom was the most important value to me, and is until today the most important value. I see, um, in, in particular in our Western countries today, there's an enormous search for security, for safety, not so much for freedom anymore. But I can see people like the see, for example, who are always risk takers. And adventures, and this is uh, why I made actually this film, because it's uh, about taking risks and doing something, maybe something even stupid or crazy. But you have to do it because you know that you are maybe the only one who can do that. Thank you so, so much. Thanks a lot.